Welcome, everyone. Um, I can see we've got folks already joining us today for our webinar. We are excited to talk to you about taking control of invasives in your landscape. Um, we'll be getting started in just a couple of minutes. A few housekeeping items. We have, um, let's see here. <clears throat> Please utilize the Q&A uh, for your questions. The chat is currently disabled, um, but I will be sharing some documents in the chat. So you will have access to those. You just won't be able to kind of have um, side by side conversations. But if you have a question for our speaker, please do enter that into the Q&A. The webinar will be recorded and the recordings will be available um, via our YouTube channel, as well as in an on demand fashion with the registration link that you were provided when you registered for the webinar. You will be able to click on that link and access the recording uh, a few hours after the, the webinar has concluded. It takes a little bit of time to process. So again, thank you all for coming today. We'll get started in just a few moments. All right, well, it's one o'clock and we've got um, a good number of the folks that registered in here with us today. So welcome again um, to our webinar today, Taking Control of Invasives. This is the third part in a three-part webinar series, but don't worry if you missed the first two, they are gonna be available on our YouTube channel for viewing so you can get all caught up on the good information that was shared in the previous two webinars. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to, again, thank you for joining us um, and also um, to go ahead and um, talk to you a little bit about who I am, what the program is, and how you can learn a little bit more about us. So if you're new to a UF IFAS extension presentation, uh, we are a function of the land grant university system. We work with the University of Florida to provide research based, based education our communities. And we do that by, you know, looking at the information that's available to us, distilling it down, making it applicable for the people in our communities with the ultimate goal being to enhance the quality of life for everyone who, who lives within our community. And we do that in a number of ways. Um, you're going to be hearing from our Master Gardener volunteer, Amy Stripe, today, and she is part of our residential horticulture program here at the Manatee County Extension Office. My name is Alyssa Vinson, and I'm the residential horticulture agent here in Manatee County, and I oversee our residential horticulture program, which includes the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, as well as other associated types of um, ecological landscaping, um, tree care, things like that. And I am not alone. We have several other agents in the office who focus on different program areas. So we have folks who work in commercial horticulture, commercial livestock. We have folks who work with the commercial agriculture 
agricultural industry as far as row crops are concerned. We have a marine resources and fisheries agent. We have folks who work specifically with the um, food and nutrition program, getting education into our local schools. And I want to highlight a few of the impacts of our extension services here in Manatee County from 2019. You can see that we had over $2 million in value of new licenses and CEUs provided to pesticide license holders. Those are folks in the landscape industry who are responsible for applying pesticide in the landscape. We had over $860,000 of value in volunteer time. And a lot of that comes from our Master Gardener volunteers. We have over 100 volunteers who dedicate thousands of hours to our community every year to provide valuable educational opportunities. We also have a whole host of 4-H volunteers and other county uh, volunteers that help out in a variety of different ways. 28,000 youth were educated through the 4-H Youth Development Program, and that's through a variety of different clubs that they manage, as well as participation in the county fair and ag venture. And then we had over 14 million gallons of water saved to Manatee County Utilities customers. And that's mainly through our landscape um, rebate program related to retrofitting irrigation to save water in the home landscape. So we are excited to share with you today um, lots of great information about how you can take control of invasives in your landscape. I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and let Amy get herself started. If you're new to us here at Extension, we're really glad you're here. Um, if you've been with us before, we're excited to see you again. And we look forward to um, answering your questions. Just a couple housekeeping items. Again, please use the Q&A to ask questions throughout the webinar and I will um, answer some of them as we go and then others I will save to be answered at the end. And with that. Are you seeing my, uh, my presentation? Yes, you're good. Okay, great. All right, welcome everybody. This is part three, the final installment on invasives. Today we're gonna to talk about taking control of invasives in your landscape. Um, but before we get into the, uh, the murder and mayhem to come, <laughs> I thought uh, I might give you some greetings of the season. Uh, this is what's going on in my yard right now. October in Central Florida is spectacular. Um, this is one of my muley grasses. It's in full bloom right now. Muley grass is, of course, a native grass, Muleybergia capillaris. It puts out this stunning pinky, purpley blossom in October, pretty much here in Central Florida. People drive by my house. They stop in the street and look at this. It's just gorgeous. It, nothing makes me happier in the garden at this time of the year. Um, on the, the picture on your upper right is actually our seed capsules on a Swietinia mahogany, which we talked about last week. That is our native mahogany. We talked about it as being a great substitute uh, or alternative to certain native, or I'm sorry, invasive uh, tree species. If you have room in your yard and if you're in the right uh, cold hardiness zone, it is a warmer, warmer type plant. This is a stunning thing to have. Um, Mahogany trees, the, the Florida mahogany was uh, pretty much over harvested for, as the commercial source of mahogany wood. Now uh, the Honduras mahogany, which is um, Swietenia macrophylla, is really the source of commercial mahogany. But these seed pods are, I mean, this is a very thick type of wood. Um, they split open in the spring and they release about 100 little winged seeds. Um, the seeds, by the way, I have had very good luck uh, propagating from seeds, mahogany seeds, for our plant fair, uh, for uh, trees for sale in our plant fair, which is coming up March 6th. A little plug for you there. Uh, the bottom picture on the, on the right is, of course, um, sunshine mimosa. That is uh, mimosa strigulosa, a native ground cover. This is what mine looks like right now. I did not take this picture, but mine looks exactly like this. Uh, sunshine mimosa is kind of peculiar. It seems to be very site specific in terms of how it behaves. So master gardeners will be looking at this going, mine doesn't look like that right now. But mine just so happens to look like this right now. It'll start slowing down when the weather gets cool. And by the way, the bees just go bananas for these blossoms. The little blue flower here in the middle bottom, that is actually Jacamontia pentathos. That is another native. It's in the morning glory family. It blooms in the spring and the fall. And then, of course, we have our 
winter visitors here, the turkey vultures. Um, I don't have a lot against these guys. I mean, you know, they will like eat your windshield wipers and stuff like that, but um, they do, my, my dad used to call them um, solid waste management units, or solid waste disposal units, I'm sorry, which is exactly what they do. They do serve a, a good purpose. I don't like them on my roof because I've got three rain barrels um, that have downspouts, you know, from the roof, and I don't particularly want their byproducts in my rain barrels. So my husband gets out there, we keep a, a compost pile behind our house and there's always a couple of dead palm fronds in there. And so my husband gets out in our driveway and flaps those palm fronds. He's a bigger bird than they are. And they really don't like that. I'm sure the neighbors think like he's a witch doctor or something, but anyway. And then this is, oh, this is Nancy Hammer. This is her, her ode to, uh, to Muley Grass. She's another master gardener here in Manatee County. All right, just a couple of housekeeping details. Um, last week, we presented a list of 15 common invasive landscape plants and then their alternatives. We presented native alternatives and non-native alternatives. I wasn't particularly happy with the organization of that presentation. Um, I don't know how you guys felt, but I was feeling it was disorganized as I was presenting it. So I have put all that information into a spreadsheet form. So you've got the the invasive plant and its native and non-native alternatives on a little spreadsheet and you can download those from the chat uh, link to, from the chat box today. Also is a one pager listing all of those web addresses that I have referenced in parts one and two as well as today's. It's a real simple single page tells you what it is so you don't have to be you know writing down um, HTTPS slash backward whatever you've got that to download. So today's agenda. Now this picture in the background, this is a lovely carrot wood. They were of course introduced by the nursery trade in Florida as a landscape, a beautiful landscape shade tree, which they are. Look at the lovely shade it's providing this particular house. The issue of course is that they are, they will shade out everything underneath them, including natives. They um, pop up like crazy and they are now a prohibited species. So, you know, controlling invasive plants in our neighborhoods cannot be emphasized enough. In my neighborhood, um, there's a carrot wood directly across the street. It's not a big one, but it does produce. It's, been, it's quite mature. There is also a Melaleuca in a landscape down the street from me. And then there's a big stand of Brazilian pepper in another. I am constantly pulling up seedlings in my own yard. So this morning, I just went out and literally, I'm telling you, I was out there less than five minutes and I came up with um, a little Brazilian pepper seedling right here. I came up with a little carrot wood seedling right here in the same landscape bed. And then this is, um, this is asparagus fern. This is asparagus uh, ethiopicus and it is a caution. If you've ever run across this, it's got nasty thorns. It's a horrible thing. And then not to be outdone by those particular specimens, I just took a really quick trip around the yard and I found this. <laughs> this is a Brazilian pepper. It was growing in one of my Thakahatchee grasses. So of course I couldn't see it till it got this big. And then I found a, a healthy specimen here, another carrot wood. And I'm telling you, this is less than like I said, less than five minutes around my yard. And I tell you, I'm out there all the time. So uh, to make matters worse, I am down the street two miles from a preserve. And really the idea of controlling invasives is to principally keep them out of natural areas, not to mention controlling them and keeping them from spreading in your yard and then to your neighbor's yards. Um, so there's usually four types of uh, control options for um, you know, for invasive plants uh, from kind of the, the, the most uh, environmentally friendly to the least is preventative, mechanical, and chemical. Uh, biologicals are actually a very environmentally friendly way to control invasives, but this is a tool that's really more open to professional like land managers and so forth who are dealing with, with invasives in natural areas. The homeowner doesn't really have a lot of options in terms of biologicals, but we will cover that. And then a real quick word about replacements. Now I'm not talking about choices, like what you can put in place of what, I just am gonna address really quickly the um, allelopathic uh, 
properties of certain invasives that you remove, it makes it difficult to put something where they were until uh, you get a little bit of time go by. Then we're gonna just talk about invasives in neighborhood conservation areas. That's a big topic, but I did wanna touch on that because I know there's a great deal of interest in that. Then resources for your neighborhood and then how you can get involved um, it, you know, beyond your own yard. Uh, talk today will be about 45 minutes, I should think, by the way. So let's talk about step number one. Method number one, of course, is preventative. These should look familiar to you if you have been on the last uh, two, two webinars. Again, we go to the Atlas of Florida Plants as our source of nativity for plants. This is a database of native plants and non-native plants that have become established in the wild. And that's where we go to see, is this a native plant or not a native plant? Then the FLEPSI, as we call it, the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council and the University of Florida IFAS assessment is where we go to determine the evaluations in terms of invasiveness of, of non-native plants. Now, as an IFAS person, as a Master Gardener volunteer, of course, the assessment is my kind of go-to place. So just to remind you all that the, um, this, the assessment is a database. It provides guidelines for IFAS personnel in making recommendations for use of non-native plant species in landscaping. It is a non-regulatory um, list, as is the FLEPSI. There are no regulatory teeth in any of this. Um, these, this particular database uh, is updated continuously. It employs a quantitative predictive tool, which is very important. So in other words, it's taking a look, it's evaluating not just plants that have already escaped captivity or cultivation, but those that uh, are still under cultivation and captivity, but have, you know, what is their potential to becoming invasive? Uh, we have North Central and South Florida regions, over 900 plants, and uh, there are three conclusions. Red light, do not recommend, and you'll see them labeled as prohibited, invasive, invasive no uses, which means even under best management practices, you should not plant that, that guy. And then high invasion risk. Anytime you see risk associated with a conclusion, that's where the predictive tool has been used. So red light, yellow light, you may recommend, but you must manage to prevent escape. And then green light is okay to recommend. So here's a couple of, of examples. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So in terms of the preventative, when you look at a red light or a yellow light, you're probably better off just go, not going there. Do not plant those. If you must plant a yellow light, well, really, you want to err on the side of conservatism unless you can commit to a lot of gardening. Um, good example. So um, volunteers showed up in my yard a few years ago, Azamia furforatia, which is the cardboard plant or cardboard palm. It's not really a palm but it showed up and my husband really loves the habit of growth. It is a beautiful plant, but it is a yellow light per the assessment. So I said to him, well, you know, okay, it is a dioecious plant. In other words, there are separate, they have separate male and female plants. So if we have a male plant, I guess we're pretty safe, but if it's a female plant, she's gonna produce seeds and we're gonna have to, you know, make sure that we cut those off before they, um, before they have a chance to disperse. Well, that worked really well for a couple of years. And then of course, you know how that goes. I mean, I'm a lazy gardener. And so I, you know, did my best, but then it's like, oh. And so it got away from me and sure enough, little cardboard's popping up everywhere. I don't have time for that. The plant's gone. <laughs> All right, some examples. Here's the a red light. We talked about this last week. This is the bowstring hemp Dracenia uh, hyacinthoides. All of the uh, Sansevierias have been reclassified now into the Dracaena genus. Um, this guy goes from friend to foe in no time. Um, it starts out as a lovely, lovely house plant. I mean, every time I see this in somebody's office, and Susan, you know I'm talking about you, uh, I, or, or in, in, as a house plant, I kind of get the heebie-jeebies. I mean, because really this guy, what happens is it outgrows the pot, and then it gets plumped into the landscape. And then you have like what you see in this middle photo. Uh, the issue with this plant is that it not only produces by rhizomes, which are underground stems, but it also uh, will produce from seed. It will grow from seed. And any plant part that is left behind, a piece of the root or a piece of the leaf, will root. 
That's what makes this thing really a nasty customer. I've seen it, like this picture on the right, I've seen it uh, in landscapes where they put it in kind of planters. But again, um, if you're going in there and thinning it out, you gotta make sure you dispose of every single bit of plant material that you're pulling out. And then you have to watch out for seeds dispersing as well. Now, this is an example of a high invasion risk. So this is the yellow alamanda. This is the viney type, the alamanda cathartica, very, very popular ornamental landscape plant. And it has not escaped cultivation as yet, um, but it is at risk. Um, it is a high invasion risk. And that's because it, uh, it does spread by rhizomes. Many sprouts will appear at the base of this plant. And really to keep it under control, you have to pinch it frequently. Pinching meaning once the blossom is finished, pinch it off before it goes to seed. So you might consider an alternative to that one. Here's a yellow light. Um, this is a caution in North Central and South Florida. This is the yellow alder, Turnera omifolia. Um, alder seeds often germinate near the base. Um, it gets weedy very, very quickly. You know, but one popular argument I do hear from people against removing problem species like a caution species is that, well, I'm in my yard all the time. I'll make sure it does not, you know, it's well maintained. I'll make sure I pull all of the, you know, the seedlings that come up, all the volunteers, I'll keep it under control. The reality is that even with the utmost caution, um, an invasive can spread, the seeds can scatter in the wind, a bird will come along and take a berry, a piece of the plant will wind up in a storm drain and get carried you know, miles down the road. So really um, invasive species cannot be managed perfectly. All it takes is one escaped individual. So, so preventative, the very best way to approach, just don't put these guys in the landscape. Now mechanical, mechanical um, control, you must periodically scout, <laughs> uh, ideally once a week in your landscape. I mean, some of these species can take root and grow vigorously within days. And this is my big Brazilian pepper. I'm looking at him down here. My husband looked at me horrified when I walked in the house with that thing. Um, and you, you really, when you, if you're manually pulling, you want to do it when they're young enough to remove all of the roots. So um, I think I managed to get all of the roots here on this little baby Brazilian pepper. Um, and of course, it's very young. So that was a fairly easy thing to do. The key though to manually pulling is to make sure you get all of that plant material, including all the roots, because a lot of these species re-sprout. And I'm thinking carrot wood, I'm thinking Brazilian pepper as two, uh, pepper tree is two good examples. Now for vines that are tightly wrapped around other plants or trees or even fences or trellises, if it's an invasive vine. Um, as long as it has no aerial roots, you can sever it off at the base. And then you'll probably want to follow it up with a chemical application of a herbicide, which is going to be our next step. Now, I have to say that um, if you've got a, a mature tree, please do consider getting a professional tree removal service. I mean, felling trees is, a, is can be very, very dangerous unless you know what you're doing. You have to have means for disposing of what you have got, you know, chopped down. So, and, and I think a lot of these places can be very reasonable. You can certainly get one or two quotes to remove, you know, some big mature trees from your property if, uh, if in fact they are invasive and you want, you want to get them gone and you're willing to go to that, um, to that extent. Now, you know, ground covers, there's a lot of tough ground cover species that can be difficult to remove by hand. So in these cases, kind of save your elbow grease, let the, let the sun do the work for you. And that involves what they call soil solarization and cover the area with a sheet of clear plastic in the hotter months. Make sure you tuck it in good, you know, all around and um, let, the, let the sun go, go to work and do its, do its thing. Um, it's a very simple, inexpensive process. If you've got cloudier weather, you might want to leave it longer. Um, obviously, this is an ideal thing in the summer months to do because it gets hottest then. Uh, for things like that bowstring hemp, for example, this would work well. You can remove as much as you, as you can by hand, mechanically by hand, and then if you solarize that area, that will 
take care of any uh, remaining rhizomes, roots, uh, any of the, the other plant parts that could re-sprout, get them good and dead. Now, the emphasis here is on clear plastic. So it's kind of counterintuitive, you know, people go black, black plastic, that is really will get hot. Well, yes, well, black and opaque plastics will absorb heat from the sun, but you want that sun heat to get through. You want it to get through to heat the soil below. So black plastic, no, clear plastic, yes. And again, um, you can consider doing this with uh, plants that are, are taller plants, but if you can get them down to a, a reasonable level, you can certainly solarize them. This is not just limited to ground covers. And then mulch works great for plants that need full sun, like this, this is um, Urena lobata on the, on the left, which some of you will recognize as Caesar's weed. Caesar's weed gets eight to 10 feet tall. But the one thing it does love is it loves a sunny riverbank. And we're talking full sun. So if you cannot manually get all the plant parts out of here, cut it down as far as you can go and put a good three to five, maybe even six inches of mulch on top of it that will shade it out. You might have to apply, uh, renew the mulch a couple of times over, over a year period to make sure it's on there good and thick, but that works really, really well. Now, in terms of disposing of plant material, uh, you know, you really want to get stuff out of your landscape before it goes to a flower or seed. Clearly, you don't want to yank stuff and have seeds left behind. Um, so the same goes when you're disposing of it. You don't want to put into your yard waste anything that has seeds or flowers in it because this stuff goes out to landfills, it can re-sprout, uh, it's you're kind of defeating the purpose of that. Uh, with certain species, uh, the timing can be tricky, but really spring is a great time for things like Brazilian pepper removal because it doesn't set, set berry until this, the fall. Uh, air potato vine is the same thing. Uh, so you, you can keep an eye on some of these guys and realize, and kind of you know, make your calendar and say, when is the best time to get it out of the landscape before it goes to seed? The air drying, it works if you have the room for it. If you've got um, uh, plants, invasive plants that can re-sprout from any vegetative part, you can certainly air dry them so that that desiccates them, that makes them non-viable. And then clipping and compost, real, or chipping and compost, you really only want to do that if you have no seeds or flowers present. Now, I know a lot of you are, are professional composters. Um, I'm not, I'm the lazy gardener, remember, so I have my little compost heap, but I don't turn it. I'm not real, um, you know, a real, real diligent about making sure it gets hot enough to kill weed seeds. So, you know, if you're kind of in my camp, best to just kind of make sure you put no seeds or flowers uh, in, in a compost heap. If you're going to bag stuff, uh, the compostables can go in like craft paper bag or those biodegradable plastics. If you have things that cannot go into compost, like some of these seeds we're talking about, like air potatoes, you want to put those in a thicker plastic, like a polyethylene plastic, and you can leave those in the sun, what we call bag and bake. It can be clear plastic, bag and bake. And that really helps to sterilize and or promote um, you know, decomposition. Now burning, we're gonna basically say, don't do that because there are, there are city and county ordinances about burning. I know like in Sarasota, I believe there may be a burn ban throughout the county. I'm not, don't quote me on that, but, but in other words, there are some ordinances you need to pay attention to. Uh, you certainly don't wanna be burning things in burn ban months in here in Florida where we have dry, very dry weather. And then there's another associated uh, risk of burning if you have ever, like had a contact with a Brazilian pepper tree, you know how irritating it can be to your skin. Imagine what the smoke from burning Brazilian pepper will do. It attacks your mucous membranes, it attacks your eyes, it's really horrific. So we're just gonna say like at this point, especially in the city limits, no burning. Okay, chemical. This is kind of, we're getting in here, you're least environmentally friendly. But for plants that will re-sprout or are difficult to kill, such as vines with aerial roots, herbicides may be required. Now, there are several different types of applications for chemical herbicides. Soil residual is one application where you're targeting roots. 
the ap apical bud, foliar, basal bark, and cut stub treatments. We're going to go through each one of these in a minute. So those are examples of how to apply herbicides. Um, Triclopyr and glyphosate are examples of effective herbicides. They're very common. You must, however, follow label instructions. It is the law. I will say that um, certain brands of like Triclopyr, which is, there's a brand called Garlon at high concentrations, is a quite a pricey product. Um, so keep that in mind. Glyphosate uh, goes by the brand name Roundup, among others now. And, uh, but you want to make sure, again, that you are using a herbicide that is labeled for use as intended. Good example, glyphosate is not something you're going to use as a soil residual herbicide because it, uh, glyphosate binds very tightly with soil. It is basically rendered inert when it hits the soil. It needs to translocate to roots via the green bits, the green bits of your plant. So you put glyphosate on the green bits, it can translate to the roots, but if you don't have that green bit, just spraying that root with glyphosate is not gonna do anything. So um, this is a method, this is the cut stump method. This is where you wanna get the thing out of the landscape altogether. Uh, and this is literally where you chainsaw your tree or your shrub as close to the ground as possible. And then you apply a uh, herbicide basically around the outer inch or two of living tissues. In other words, kind of the cambium layer there. The, um, the herbicide typically needs to be applied immediately after you've cut it down. I mean, you cannot let that stump uh, even begin to think about uh, compartmentalizing any wound. You want to get to it immediately, especially in the case of like Brazilian pepper tree. Uh, and carrot wood, I would say. You might need repeat applications also on some of these really stubborn, stubborn guys. Now, uh, this guy, this particular applicator here, he has put a dye into his herbicide to ensure that he's covering that circumference, or the, yeah, the circumference of that stump, um, you know, adequately. And I will have to say that uh, this is totally doable in a home landscape. You can certainly do this on your own. Uh, you don't need, make sure you use the right protective gear, et cetera. Like I said, follow instructions uh, when doing so. Now, uh, to kill trees or shrubs and, that you want to leave standing, now you're kind of going, now why would I want to leave it standing? Well, if it's in a part of your yard that is not like visible from the street or is, um, you know, kind of in your back 40 or, or you don't have the, the means to get um, all this stuff out of there if you cut it down. Uh, you can certainly leave it standing. It will, you will it'll, you'll kill it with herbicide, but then it will over time decompose, deteriorate. The carpenter ants will go to work. Um, you might leave it as a snag for wildlife, whatever. But anyway, so here are some of these methods, uh, basil bark, girdling, frill, or hack and squirt methods. Don't you love these names? <laughs> I mean, hack and squirt sounds like a law firm. No, no, no offense to any attorneys out there, but I look at hack and squirt LLC, may I help you? But anyway, all right, just a little aside. Um, so basal bark basically means on a tree or shrub that has, you know, a, a smaller uh, diameter, maybe six inches or less with kind of smooth bark, you can apply your herbicide to the bottom 12 to 18 inches of the, of the trunk. This is a very slow process. Uh, you might have to do it more than once, but this is one method that works for certain species. Then girdling is the guy in the middle here. He's basically taking a hand ax and he's cutting away a four to six inch strip uh, around the circumference of that tree, uh, you know, getting into that cambium layer, and then he's going to apply herbicide to that fresh wound all around. Um, hack and squirt is the, the picture on the, on the right where the, the guy has taken an ax, literally chopped a, a big, you know, chunk into the side of that particular trunk, and then he's applied a herbicide. A uh, frill is a similar. Frill is if you have a tree or shrub with really pliable bark, and you can just by hand kind of peel back the bark, create like a little kind of cup, and then spray your herbicide um, in there. Now for non-woody plants, uh, there's basil stem, apical bud, and foliar methods. 
for your, for your uh, Dracaenia, for your bowstring hemp's, for example, that basal stem herbicide application works pretty well. What you do is you literally spray the, um, you literally spray the base of each one of those stems with the appropriate herbicide. And it does a pretty good job. Oyster plant we talked about last week, Tritoscantia spathacea. Uh, if you apply a herbicide to the apical bud, that is the growing point. So that's shown in this picture here on the left. This is the apical bud right here. By the way, this is not an oyster plant, but this is a picture that shows you what an apical bud looks like. If you just spray that, that is great. So you're not getting herbicide all over the landscape. You're just limiting it to that growing point on that plant. Now, foliar methods, that's probably the one that we're all most familiar with, right? This is where you get your glyphosate, your Roundup, and you go out there and you spray and you're covering leaves and everything. Um, foliar methods may be the only uh, effective way to get to vines that have aerial roots. So like, uh, oh, so like those Hartley philodendrons, you know, those great little house plants that are hanging baskets in your kitchen and stuff. And then they got these little leaves and then you put them in the landscape and the leaves literally get this big. So those guys, they put out little aerial roots along, you know, along the vine, along the stem. And so by cutting them off of the base, you're not gonna, it's not gonna cut it because every place there has a little aerial root that can root. So foliar application is kind of the only way to get after those, which is challenging, especially if it's growing on a tree that you don't wanna damage. Um, so that, that makes it kind of tough. Now, I'm not going to cover soil residual application because that's really used in only very specific instances. You really got to know what you're doing. Because you're applying uh, a herbicide to roots, uh, you could be damaging. If roots have grafted over from other neighboring plants, you could easily damage roots on neighboring plants that you want to keep. So I wouldn't even get into that uh, unless you, you wanted to bring in a professional for that. Now, I know a lot of you are sitting there going, okay, Amy, I've got uh, Mexican petunia, how do you get rid of it? I'm not gonna go into specifics on all of our invasive problems in landscapes, and I do apologize. I would love to go there, but we'd be here all afternoon. So, but I have some great resources for you uh, to, to look into. So. The first place I would go is the, um, the IFAS UFL Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants. They have detailed directions specific to each species on preventative, mechanical, and chemical controls, which is a homeowner, that's what you're interested. They also have some biological controls listed in there as well. But again, like I said earlier, not quite as available for the homeowner. Um, you go to their, their homepage, this is the URL, you go to their drop down menu, it says plant directory. There are 39 plants in that database currently as of yesterday with management information. Of the 15 plants that we presented last week, the 15 common invasive landscape plants, about half of them um, are in this database with management information. And here's what that looks like. So this is a screen grab. This is our Elephant ear, <laughs> our wild taro Colocasia esculenta. Um, they have a picture. They uh, here's a bunch of links here. There's a management plan. There's some other information on it. If you click on management plan, this is the management plan for Colocasia esculenta preventative, cultural, mechanical, biological, and chemical. Now, uh, a lot of this website is oriented towards professionals, meaning land manager type people, but it's very good homeowner information nonetheless. Some of these species in here, this is a very abbreviated kind of control here for this guy. Basically, it says don't plant it, right, <laughs> after you read through it. But um, if you go to, for example, the uh, camphor tree, which was one of our 15 uh, last week, there is over a page and a half of control information on camphor trees. So this is kind of the first place to go. From this, there are great UF publications. So for detailed descriptions of all those methods, you know, that, that hack and squirt LLC, <laughs> the, um, you know, the, you know, the hack and squirt, the, the, the cut stump method, all those methods described in, in more detail, as well as herbicides for use by homeowners, this publication here, Herbicides to Kill Invasive Trees in the Home, Landscape, and Surrounding Natural Areas 
is excellent. There is a table uh, in this particular publication. It looks like this. As you can see, it says table one, herbicide, active ingredients and product concentration available for control of invasive plant species. So it lists in alphabetical order here, the active ingredient, uh, the container size, where you can buy it. And then there's some comments here that are pretty useful. So remember what I said about glyphosate and soil, uh, residual soil treatments? Glyphosate, not absorbed by plant roots. Right, there it is again. But this is great. So this gives you an idea of some of the herbicides that are available um, and where you can find them. Now the next source of really, next really good publication, again, detailed descriptions on all those methods I cited, as well as mechanical methods specific to species is the integrated management of non-native plants in natural areas in Florida. Again, whilst this is targeting, um, land managers and people like that, great information for you as a homeowner if you have these in your yard. Here's an example. Um, this particular table lists plants by plant family. And by the way, it's not just invasives. There are some non-invasives that are listed in this table. So if you're a land manager and you wanna get rid of say, uh, I don't know, you wanna get rid of Mexican fan palm out in natural areas, it will tell you how to do that. I just picked this one right here. Oops, I'm so sorry. I just picked this one, Asteracea family. This is Sphagnicola uh, trilobata. This is Wodelia. And it tells you the treatment here. It gives you the brand name of the product, the percentage of herbicide you should be using. It gives you comments on it. Here's the Nandina domestica, which we discussed last week, the heavenly bamboo. And again, it talks about um, how you can control that species. So this is a very, very good publication. And if that weren't enough, there are more UF publications on specific plant species. So there is one on carrot wood, there's one on Brazilian pepper tree, there's one on kogon grass. And they typically, if it is a prohibited or a, a really um, insidious invasive, they, they, these entire publications are devoted to life cycle and control and management. Uh, you'll find a lot of invasives that uh, are all about, you know, how, how they do and, you know, what hardiness zone and what their growth habit is. And you're going, where's the control? But if you're looking for control on those, you can go to that previous publication I just showed and you'll find that information. Now, interestingly enough, a participant last week emailed us and said, uh, gee, I wish you had addressed running bamboo in the landscape. And so I exchanged some emails with him and, and I said, well, I said, here's why bamboo sort of doesn't come up on the radar a lot when we're talking about invasive plants in natural areas. And that's because there's only one species of running bamboo that has become established or has become naturalized in the wild in Florida. Um, that's the, um, the bisset bamboo, the um, Phyllostachys bizetii. Now, there's a number of other running bamboos that are in the University of Florida IFAS assessment, but they have not escaped cultivation yet. They have been rated as a high invasive risk, but they are not out there yet. So this is kind of a problem that so far, knock on wood, is more or less a, a home, a, 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 you know, basically a home landscape problem. But I did give him, I said, you know, there is a publication on bamboo control. So here it is. Anyway, that's why I threw that one up there. Now, let's talk about biologicals. Um, classical biological control is, you know, sometimes the only economically and environmentally sustainable solution for some of these exotic pests, you know, plants that have become firmly established. And, you know, the one thing you have to ensure, of course, is you cannot be releasing these, you know, exotic natural enemies without making sure that they are safe to release. You know, they're not gonna go after stuff you wanna, you wanna keep. Uh, the definition is the use of living natural enemies to control pests, as simple as that. Uh, now the living natural enemy, by the way, can be a bug, it could be a disease, it could be another plant, uh, it could be another animal. Uh, the, can, the pests we're controlling could be plants and animals as well. So, you know, biologicals cover a, quite a wide waterfront, if you will, of issues in terms of invasives. 
Strictly speaking, it does involve human intervention, i.e. human introduction. Now, this is the giant Salvinia. Don't you love this name, Salvinia molesta? Uh, this is a, an invasive aquatic plant I had never heard of until a couple of years ago when I was starting to research invasives. And that's because it's largely, I've never run across it, and probably because it's been largely kept under control by the Salvinia weevil. Isn't she a pretty little gal? Now, the Salvinia weevil was not introduced into Florida. It arrived fortuitously. Scientists did introduce it in Texas and Louisiana to control this species, but it just arrived here as they call it adventitiously. So as far as the strict definition of a biological goes, your Salvinia weevil is not it in Florida. We consider it again an adventitious or maybe even beneficial, you know, uh, species. Uh, but, you know, not surprisingly, the focus of biological controls in the state of Florida has been on aquatic invasives because obviously a huge chunk of our economy is dependent upon the quality of our waterways. So you will see things like um, biologicals uh, have been put to use on alligator weed and water hyacinth to a fair degree of success. On the right, we have hydrilla and water lettuce. To a lesser extent, it's been, they've been successful. Hydrilla we talked about, I think, in our first, uh, the first part of our, our webinar. This is uh, an a, a aquarium plant that was introduced and aquarium plant dealers grew it in canals in Florida and then it quickly escaped cultivation. It gets carried from waterway to waterway on boat trailers, boats, et cetera. And they do utilize a whole suite of controls on Wedelia mechanical, chemical, and biological. One of the biologicals for hydrilla, by the way, you've heard of it, I'm sure, is the, um, the sterile, uh, the sterile uh, carp. And the problem with it is, is that uh, the grass, sterile grass carp, it is a generalist predator, which means it eats stuff other than hydrilla. So it might be competing with some of our or other fish species for food, you do need a permit from the FWC to release that sterile fish carp, by the way. So looking at some terrestrial, uh, so sorry, terrestrial weeds, um, here we have from left to right, the tropical soda apple. That by the way is Lisa Hickey, one of our agents. Um, then you have the air potato vine, then you have your stone pepper tree, old wood climbing fern and on, fern and on the far, right, the Melaleuca. So uh, really biologicals for tropical soda, apple, and um, air potato beetle have shown medium to high levels of suppression. In terms of Melaleuca, the, uh, there is a whole suite, again, of uh, controls used, especially in natural areas, including prescribed fire, herbicides, but there's also a um, Melaleuca uh, uh, weevil, leaf weevil, that will reduce flowering up to about 80 to 90 percent. So that's kind of a good news. Ongoing research for Brazilian pepper tree and old world climbing fern. Um, oh, and by the way, the um, tropical soda apple uh, chap, I, I, I don't know what it is, what the biologic, it's a leaf beetle, I'm pretty sure. It was released in 2003, so that's going back quite a ways. But um, so kind of update for a homeowner, of course, is the air potato beetle. You guys are probably all familiar with this. The Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services uh, has a, a citizen science program called Air Potato Patrol. The, uh, the lovely little um, Leoceris chenai, the air potato beetle, was at one time available to homeowners for free. We used to, we used to have to reserve your beetles. They were shipped out to various extension offices. Um, we kept them in the refrigerator till you could come pick yours up. But the demand was so high that we, and we cannot uh, produce this beetle fast enough. Um, so right now, air potato beetles are basically limited to natural, release in natural areas. So kind of watch this space. Um, and Alyssa might be able to address a little bit more after I'm finished here today about if there's any update on this. But, the, the life cycle of the air potato is basically, it dies back in the winter, the bulb bile, which is the aerial tuber, falls to the ground, it sprouts in the spring, then along about in the summer months when our rains start, that's when it puts on growth, 
that's when you want to introduce your beetle. He does, he or she does this kind of damage you can see on the bottom photo on the right and really does disrupt the reproductive uh, process in this particular plant. So a lot fewer of those aerial bulbiles will be produced. And then you can go in in the fall along about like August, September, and you can collect those, hopefully very few bulbiles, and you can dispose of those. Uh, the beetle will not eat the bulbiles, uh, bulbils, unfortunately. I mean, I think if, if it gets really starving hungry, they might, but they don't, you can't count on them to do that. So the best way to dispose of air potatoes is to throw them in your freezer for 24 hours or dip them in a bleach solution for several days and that will kind of render them non-viable. Burning is another way. Okay, you didn't hear that from, if you live, you know, not in the city limits and there's no burn ban, you know, some people do burn their air potato, their air potato ball boss. But again, a freezing or bleach also works. Now, Brazilian pepper tree. A Brazilian pepper tree, of course, is, um, is the native range of Brazilian pepper is in uh, Northern Argentina, Paraguay, Southern Brazil. There are a number of insects that help keep it under control there. There are two that have been uh, found safe for release in Florida after intensive study. On the, uh, on the right is the Brazilian pepper tree thrips. It already has been released as of this July in limited areas. And then the, uh, the leaf galling psyllid also on the uh, the left now is pending release. Both of these bugs uh, disrupt uh, reproductive cycles. The psyllid causes leaf drop. The thrips, both the larva and the adult, uh, munch away on flowers and, and, uh, and foliage. So watch this space because hopefully some of these will be available soon for you for your yard and your particular problem. Don't laugh. People always laugh when I talk about goats, but on private lands, herbivores are often used for, you know, to forage for control. I think this is probably kogan grass. I'm not sure. I do know goats are fond of Chinese privet. I do not know much about goats. I'm sure a lot of you out there do and know like, okay, what don't they eat, right? Don't they eat just pretty much everything? So yeah, so if you have, you know, if you have sort of farmland or something like that, a goat, or goats is, is certainly not outside of the realm of, of, uh, of possibilities. Quick word about replacements. Allelopathy we talked about, I think in the first, um, in the first webinar. This is a, a chemical, it's a biochemical that plants will, uh, will produce or exude or, or volatize uh, as a defensive mechanism against getting eaten and as a competitive response to other plants. So it suppresses other plants. Keep in mind that Brazilian pepper, uh, kogan grass, malaleuca, several other invasives will release these biochemicals even after you have removed them from your landscape. Uh, depending on your soil conditions, the amount of rainfall, et cetera, some of these biochemicals might linger and kind of get in the way of you putting in a nice plant in their place. So, you know, I don't know how much time it takes to break these things down, it's all dependent. Uh, on soil conditions, like I said, but you know, you might even consider putting a sacrificial plant there uh, to see what happens. Certainly don't put a high value plant in there immediately where you've taken something out that produces these biochemicals. Uh, conservation areas, quickly. Conservation areas are land that is set aside during the development of a new neighborhood. So it's usually a requirement of county or state regs, can be mandated by the way by water management districts, the FDEP or local county governments. Now, this is basically the price the developer pays to go in and develop undeveloped lands. They have to reserve some area for conservation. It will be identified on the plat of your neighborhood and show up on your official survey. It probably will be encumbered by certain requirements for management, such as removal of invasive species, prohibition, or trimming of removal, prohibition of, of trimming or removal of native species. So there'll be some regulations associated with it. So who's responsible? Well, if the development is no longer owned by the developer, it's pretty much in the HOA's, uh, you know, bailiwick. Uh, if you are an HOA and your, your development has not been turned over to you yet by the developer, make sure you understand about the conservation areas. If the developer 
is required to remove invasives before turning it over, make sure you do tick off that box. You do not want to be responsible for removing invasive after it's come to you because it could be costing you hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's very expensive. So anyway, uh, these conservation areas are treated as common area. They may require resource management plan for invasive species management. The most important thing to take away from this is you as an individual property owner in a development of conservation areas, you do not have the right to remove or trim any vegetation. That includes removal of invasives. And there have been cases, I had a, a customer several months ago who was, a, he was on the board of an HOA and several residents had taken upon themselves to remove invasives from behind their house in conservation areas. And the fine was like in the, I mean, it was like $300,000. The fine did not go to the homeowner. It went to the HOA because they are responsible. So, um, you know, this is a whole other topic, but it's something that you really need to keep in mind. Lastly, oh, this is just an example of how you look at a, a survey or a plat where you see a conservation area. You see all the surrounding streets and then this, this little gray bit in the middle is a conservation area example. Now, resources for your neighborhood. Um, there is, you know, if, if for formal and informal, you know, resident-based neighborhood groups like an HOA, like a community group uh, or civic association can apply for grants to remove invasives from commonly owned or public property. Um, there are, in many uh, cities and counties in Florida, there are what we call neighborhood enhancement grants. Often they take the form of matching funds. I know Manatee County has it, uh, offers them up to $10,000 in matching funds. Sarasota County also has a similar thing. And it's really worth exploring if you want to get serious, especially as an HOA, about removing invasives in common areas. You can also go to the Florida Invasive Species Partnership. Um, they will have, they maintain a list of agencies and organizations that provide financial incentives to homeowners uh, to remove invasives. The last time I checked, it wasn't particularly up to date, um, but it is worth, uh, worth dipping in to it and, and checking it out. Now, here's how you can get involved uh, just in the whole area of invasive plants and other species, other types of, of you know, maybe even animals. The Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas, CISMA, if you go to their website, their homepage, there is a map of the US. If you click on the Florida section, it will break out for you the different areas within Florida. For us here in Manatee County, we are in the Suncoast CISMA and includes Pinellas, Hillsborough, Cerati, and Manatee counties. And these organizations um, are comprised, I mean, this is, this is various government groups, land grant colleges, et cetera, but they are open to anyone in the public who wants to participate. Um, the Suncoast CISMA, for example, holds work days in which you can help uh, surveying, for example, invasive reptiles. You can go tag invasive plants. You can pull invasive plants. They have these great work days. And then there are some upcoming fun activities. I think for next year, they're gonna do maybe a photo contest, I believe. And they also do regular workshops for, public, for the public and land managers on invasive species topics. So I have gone uh, just over 45 minutes. And I do want to uh, thank all of you for participating and your enthusiasm and interest. I do want to thank Alyssa and Kathy and Susan for your, um, you know, I want to give you lots of thanks. And not for the hair and makeup, by the way, but for your, um, your technical support and your, and, your, um, and your expertise. So thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, you know, I was answering questions as we went along in the background there. Um, the majority of the questions, you know, kind of uh, generally were asking, I have this specific plant, what would you recommend to get rid of it? So um, for those folks that asked those types of questions, I was sending you links to either the IFAS aquatic and invasive plants recommendations for management, uh, the websites for that. Um, or I was sending you any available EDIS fact sheets regarding those particular plants and the management of those plants. Um, there was a question in here particularly about pothos, about golden pothos. I would recommend where possible because golden pothos does tend to climb up and over a lot of other plants that mechanical removal should be your first um, option because it is hard to apply an herbicide when a plant is growing on top of other plants and not have off-target damage. Um, so that would be my general 
general um, comment there. There was a, a question regarding glyphosate, whether there are alternatives to glyphosate, and the answer to that is yes, of course, there are, are you know, hundreds of registered um, herbicides that are available for use. Um, not all of them are available for homeowner use, um, but again, it's going to be specific to your site and location and what plant you are trying to eradicate. Um, in some cases, glyphosate is the best, most efficient, and, and cost-effective tool um, in the toolbox for the removal of an invasive and I understand that there has been a lot in the media lately about glyphosate specifically, um, but I will share in the chat, as I shared with another individual, we have some folks at the University of Florida who have done extensive research on glyphosate and looked at, you know, comparing it to other available herbicides, it is actually um, less damaging than some of the other available herbicides out there as far as human health is concerned. Um, so just, I will share that in the chat with you so that you have that information. And I know that we could probably do a whole presentation just on glyphosate and dealing with some of the misconceptions and some of the things that we are concerned about, right? Because glyphosate is used extensively its use has increased dramatically over the last 20 years. Um, and it is used probably in situations where it shouldn't be used, right? Namely, anybody can go out and buy a bottle of Roundup and spray it all over their yard if they want to. Um, and maybe that's not the most efficient way to deal with the broadleaf weeds you have in your lawn and landscape. Um, you know, we would recommend generally look at your um, cultural, uh, factors first, things like irrigation, mowing, whether or not you have the right plant in the right place before even jumping to that um, chemical solution. Um, so uh, yes, there will be a recording of this. This will be available on our YouTube channel. I will, um, let me grab really quick for you all um, the link there to the glyphosate fact sheet that I mentioned as well as the link to our YouTube channel. So there um, in the chat box is the link to the glyphosate fact sheet. And here um, is the link to our YouTube channel. There you are. Um, that way you have those links. And let's see, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, question about vinegar. Um, can a, a solution of, uh, you know, very uh, high percentage vinegar to water be used in place of an herbicide? Um, Amy, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, actually, vinegar, there's household vinegar, which is um, what you use uh, as just maybe a household cleaning tool or to use in cooking. Uh, that's not a very high concentration of acetic acid, which is what vinegar is. There is vinegar available as a herbicide, labeled as a herbicide, a much higher percentage. But I have to say that from a safety point of view, vinegar is very, very dangerous, as, is, as are other things. Um, people often cite you know, salt solutions, salt. Uh, can be highly damaging if you use it as a drench, it gets away from you, it could damage roots of other plants. Um, again, vinegar, you know, you, you, get, you get it in your eye, it can cause blindness. Uh, fire is another thing, a lot of people sometimes go out there and do use um, like uh, flamethrowers. Again, you know, it, yeah, it'll get rid of your plant, but you don't want to set fire to your whole neighborhood. I mean, I'm kind of exaggerating, but literally there is a publication the university has on these so-called organic alternatives to, um, to, uh, chemical, to chemical herbicides. So I think if you're concerned about chemical herbicides, the mechanical ways to go are, are as Alyssa said, consider the, the solarization as a, a really good alternative to that. And, um, and keep an eye on, you know, the, the, the best thing you can do is, is go out there and scout regularly. If you make a plant easy to pull, then it makes your job a lot easier. And by the way, I just attended a webinar last week on glyphosate by one of the, uh, or two of the scientists at the University of Florida. It was very, very good. That fact sheet reflects their findings. And really, it, it boils down to largely a semantics issue and um, how some of these lawsuits have come about, the use of language like probable cause, likely cause, carcinogenic, et cetera. 
So, you know, it's one of those things that it's, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. You cannot, you know, you're seeing those commercials on TV for the law firms that want you to call for, you know, class action suits, et cetera. You know, like anything, it's more complicated than it, than it looks. But glyphosate used properly um, with the correct, you know, if you have the correct protective equipment and so forth, using it as sparingly as possible, uh, you should be good to go. But it's a personal choice, obviously. Absolutely. And uh, with that, we are at 2.04, almost 2.05 in the afternoon, so we're a little bit over our time. So I am going um, gonna to go ahead and end the webinar, but just remember, I've shared the link to the YouTube channel. We will be posting the recording there. And thanks again, everyone. And have Thank a you all.